At least it can't get any worse. How many times have I told you not to say that? Now something worse is gonna happen. I've seen it on Happy Days. Watch in three, two, one. Good for you! Holy crap. And here I thought that after the unceremonious dunking of the Night King, Game of Thrones would just slip into a boring snooze fest. How innocent and naive I was to think I could just lay back, turn my brain off, and let the ending of Game of Thrones wash over me. Uh, hey everybody! I'm a stupid moron! Yes, I was fooled again, but apparently so was everyone else. Even the actors didn't like it. So at least we can comfort each other in our... DISAPPOINTMENT! So why was episode 5 so bad? And is it possible to be fixed? Now in my last video on Game of Thrones, I talked about how D&D don't care about characters, dramatic themes, or planning things out. They couldn't even budget any money for Jon to have a touching, emotional goodbye with Ghost. Who cares about feelings based on things built from eight years of a show? Throw that into the trash! We have to put all of our money into the burning the city to the ground scene. All D&D &D care about is spectacle. Big concept controversial ideas like war is bad. The exquisite bravery of a butterfly flying against the wind. Did you notice that once Daenerys starts burning down the city, you never see her face again. It's like her character and her emotional state don't matter. It's all sacrificed for the scene. All to force an unearned emotional feeling down your throat. It doesn't matter if the characters you've watched for eight years suddenly act like different people. D&D &D don't care about any of this. They're gonna force whatever situation they want upon you and you're just gonna have to take it. Like, why did Tyrion even tell Varys, a sneaky sneaky schemer man who has already voiced concerns about Daenerys, Jon's parentage in the first place? Why would Varys then turn around and tell Tyrion about his plan to betray Daenerys? You think season one Varys would have done that? Nope. But the characters' motivations and logic don't matter. Because D&D &D needed them to tell each other so that Danny could find out and kill Varys, so that Jon would be too turned off to sleep with her. Hey Jon, let me see your... Long Claw. Uh, I just watched a fat man with no genitals burned alive. I'm not really in the mood. Here it is then! Well, I guess Danny not getting the D from her man makes her crazy! Remember when people thought this show was woke progressive? Why does Daenerys randomly decide to kill hundreds of thousands of random innocent people, betraying everything her character stood for? D&D's answer for this is baffling. I don't think she decided ahead of time that she was going to do what she did. And then she sees the Red Keep, which is to her the home that her family built when they first came over to this country 300 years ago, looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision. That doesn't make any sense! Wouldn't that mean she wouldn't want to destroy it? Stop trying to use your brain, simple viewer. Just enjoy the spectacle of shock and horror as a city is destroyed. Rev up those friars. Why does Jamie get into a random encounter with Euron on a beach? Why does Euron even want to kill Jamie? Jamie doesn't even know. Why does the show try to randomly throw in this anti-revenge message? Up until this point, revenge has worked out pretty well for Arya. She's killed dozens, maybe even hundreds of people in the name of revenge. She literally chopped people up and fed them in a pie to the poor caretaker from Harry Potter. And the show cheered this on. But now, suddenly, revenge is bad. Why is that? D&D, tell us why. The reason we decided to follow Arya out of King's Landing and to, to see the fall of King's Landing through her eyes is, is something that we talked about with an earlier episode. You just care a lot more when you're with a character that you care about. So if we saw a lot of extras running around on fire and buildings falling apart, it might have been visually interesting, but it wouldn't have had much of an emotional impact. Of course! Who cares about logic or character or even emotionally satisfying conclusions? They've shown they don't care about any of that. No, Arya is simply a pawn. 
She's a person on a haunted house ride, being ferried from horrible scene to horrible scene. The brutal, faceless assassin, who used to be the most capable person in the world, is now running through the streets like everyone else, and is emotional again for some reason. You can't trick me again, show! Everything was so ridiculous that by the end of it, I half expected Arya to catch some falling ash and say something like, Winter has come. And when that random horse showed up, I swear, I thought slowly it would pull off a mask to reveal it was really Jock and Hakkar on all fours the whole time. And he'd say, A girl must come with me if you want to live. Then they'd gallop off into the sunset. How did it all go so wrong? And can we fix it? Like my last video, I will offer two scenarios. One in which as little as possible is changed to make the story work, and another where more fundamental aspects of the story are reworked. Now I want to make it clear, I have absolutely no problem with stories having dark or tragic endings. Heck, I'm the guy that won the movie AI to end with Haley Joe Osment trapped forever beneath the ocean, his quest a tragic failure. So I'm not some hearts and roses kind of guy. A story about Daenerys, a young and naive girl with the best of intentions, slowly becoming disillusioned and corrupted as she learns to rule until eventually she falls to the dark side? That could be a really interesting story. Breaking Bad is a show about a normal guy becoming more and more damaged and evil, and people loved it. Anyways, let's get into it. Number one, Varys and Betrayal. Like in my last video, we need things to be tangible, especially if we're supposed to buy that Daenerys is going to go crazy. We need Varys' betrayal to actually accomplish something. And no, Daenerys didn't know that Varys was trying to poison her food, and that's why she wasn't eating. I know it's confusing because it seems like Danny knows Varys betrayed her, but if you watch the scene again, she actually doesn't know until Tyrion tells her. That's why Tyrion tells Varys right before he dies that he was the one that ratted him out. Maybe we see he convinces some of the Iron Islanders to ditch Danny. Maybe he plants the seed of doubt in the Northern Army. We need scenes of the Northmen grumbling to each other like, Ah, I like that Jon Snow lad. He's the king of the north! Aye, but this foreign queen from across the sea with her flying monsters. Mutilated men in barbarian horde. I don't know about her. The talk spreads and the northern army starts to get antsy while they're marching south. Maybe a minor uprising starts and Jon has to quell it. You could even have more drama with Danny wanting the rebels executed and Jon doesn't. And if you want to take the drama further, you could have Danny say she's going to burn them. But John convinces her that they're from the North, and they deserve a better death from their Lord. So he beheads them, kind of like something Ned Stark would do. This could anger a lot of the remaining North army, leading to lots of people running away in the middle of the night. Danny wants to chase down the deserters and execute them, and John refuses. He could say he'll leave her if she does both as a northern lord and as her love. Suddenly we have a real weight and real tension pressing on Danny. The audience can see that her fears about the north are actually grounded in reality, and not just she would also feel a greater sense of betrayal and uncertainty about John that wouldn't be based around them banging. The way it is right now, Daenerys feels like that clingy girlfriend who won't stop texting you if you don't respond in the first five minutes. The point is, there needs to be something. HBO wanted D&D to make this season 10 episodes long, but D&D refused and decided to only make it six. That's why everything feels so rushed, so claustrophobic. Game of Thrones used to be a show about characters navigating a dangerous world of mystery and conflict. Now it's a world that exists only to service a few characters. It feels empty and lifeless. A friend of mine joked that before the last episode, King's Landing only existed in Cersei's throne room. Before Danny destroys the city, we saw nothing of King's Landing this season. The streets, the people. Where are all the scenes with the common people upset with Cersei's rule that Tyrion keeps mentioning? People should be running out of food now that Highgarden doesn't support Cersei. Show us some food riots. Show us Cersei trying to quell the mobs by playing up the threat of foreign invaders. It's not like that's not politically topical. 
and some, I assume, are good people. Show us the families of peasants fearing for their lives, leaving their homes and running to the capital before the battle. Build up this world that the characters are living in. When the show writers decide to cut their season's episode count almost in half, they have no one to blame but themselves when they don't set up things properly. This season of Game of Thrones feels like the Star Wars prequels, where we had a clear distinction between the character scenes and the action scenes. And most of the character scenes' only purpose was to rush us to the action scenes. Game of Thrones is doing this only with having character episodes all be rushed to simply get to the action set piece episodes. But this makes no sense because Game of Thrones is a character drama. It's always been a show about the people. It was never a show about action spectacle set pieces or high concepts. The first two seasons only contained one explosive action episode. The rest of the wars and skirmishes were barely even shown, and yet everyone considers the first two seasons the best. It's like they forgot what made it popular in the first place. Number two, Jamie. Cut out the whole Jamie going back to Cersei for no reason subplot. Not only does it completely betray all his character development, but it's utterly pointless. Jamie ends up doing nothing of importance anyway. All he does is walk around on a beach, fight Euron for absolutely no reason, and comfort Cersei as they die. Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? The only reason I can think of why D&D had Jamie go back is just because they wanted to have this scene where Tyrion frees Jamie, because it mirrors that time when Jamie freed Tyrion. You know. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Yeah, it was a nice scene, but it wasn't really worth throwing away years of character development. Number three, Euron's fleet. Euron's fleet is destroyed with such ease, it's practically a joke. The once incredibly threatening scorpions are now rendered pointless and moot. But fixing this scene is actually pretty easy. Just have it happen at night. Have Danny swoop in the night before her army attacks, using the cover of darkness to hide. She could burn some ships, slip away into the dark clouds above, and then strike again. The darkness and the confusion would make it far more believable that Danny could burn all these ships down without her dragon getting skewered. You can have a nice scene with all the sailors looking around, terrified at the ships ablaze, listening for the beating wings to alert them of the next attack. I mean, this is the show that loves to film stuff in the pitch black. The one time they could have used darkness for a plot reason, they decided not to. And if they want to get a little bit more creative, maybe a little outlandish, they could have had Danny not only attack at night, but from underwater. Everyone's expecting the dragon to attack from air, as being able to fly is obviously a huge advantage. None of these sailors are going to expect a dragon to swim under them and start burning their ships from the water's surface. You could have this intense scene where the dragon keeps popping in and out of the water, burning ships, then disappearing into the darkness below. And they could even have it so that physically, the scorpions can't even point down. Why would they? They were constructed to attack things from the air. So Euron and the rest of the crew start desperately sawing the base of the scorpions off so they can manually aim the thing down. I don't know. Seems like a pretty exciting sequence to me, and it wouldn't just be... Danny burns all the ships and doesn't die because plot. Number four. Arya and the Hound. As I talked about in the beginning, the whole revenge be bad, yo, message is absolutely absurd for Game of Thrones. It's like the Mortal Kombat people trying to act like they're some kind of positive influence on society because they don't have the women wearing sexy outfits anymore. Yes, I'm so glad the girls decided to cover up their lady bits while they brutally and graphically murder each other. I think you may have your priorities a little mixed up. But more importantly, you need Arya there. Because Clegane Bull was BORING! Last video, I said Arya killing the Night King was all plot and no character. The Hound's fight with the Mountain was all character and no plot. Noopsie! You need both! Otherwise, it's boring and pointless. The Hound is engaged in an utterly pointless fight with the Mountain as the castle falls around them. We already know they're both gonna die, so who cares? We need the Hound to actually fight the Mountain for some reason. Instead, how about we have a scene where Jon or Tyrion tells Arya, Hey, how about you go use your super assassin skills to kill Cersei as soon as possible? Daenerys is looking kinda 
crazy, and we want this whole war thing to end as quickly as possible before she snaps. Now we have an actual ticking time element to add tension. Arya's trying to kill Cersei before Daenerys does some crazy stuff. You could create some kind of scene where the Hound is fighting the Mountain, not just for his own revenge, but to keep him away from Cersei because she needs to be killed ASAP and the mountain can actually care about protecting Cersei. So we can have this nice back and forth going on between these four characters, all trying to kill each other. Sounds more interesting to me than just having two guys with sticks hitting each other again and again for no reason, except that they mad. Number five, Daenerys. The biggest mistake of them all. Now, when I first wrote the script for this video, I went into great detail why it would be completely out of character for Daenerys to commit genocide. However, it became so long, it would require its own video just for that. So let me give you the abridged version. I'm not crazy, you're crazy! Up until this episode, one of the core traits for Daenerys' character was her motivation to help the common people. The wise masters of Yonkai have sent a gift for the Silver Queen. There is far more than this awaiting you on the deck of your ship. You shall have as many ships as you require. And what do you ask in return? All we ask is that you make use of these ships. Sail them back to Westeros where you belong and leave us to conduct our affairs in peace. I have a gift for you as well. Your life. My life. And the lives of your wise masters. But I also want something in return. You will release every slave in Yunkai. Every man, woman, and child shall be given as much food, clothing, and property as they can carry as payment for their years of servitude. Reject this gift, and I shall show you no mercy. Lannister, Targaryen, Baratheon, Stark, Tyrell. They're all just spokes on a wheel. This one's on top, then that one's on top, and on and on it spins, crushing those on the ground. I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. I know what Cersei has told you, that I've come to destroy your cities, burn down your homes, murder you and orphan your children. That's Cersei Lannister, not me. I'm not here to murder. And all I want to destroy is the wheel that has rolled over rich and poor to the benefit of no one but the Cersei Lannisters of the world. That's the only reason she didn't come to Westeros in season four. Daenerys could have sailed for Westeros long ago, but she didn't. Instead, she stayed where she was and saved many people from horrible fates. Some of whom are on this island with us right now. She protects people from monsters, just as you do. That's why she came here. So we're supposed to believe she just throws that all away to psychotically kill all these innocent people? Because Varys has a failed betrayal attempt and Cersei spilled her Sunday? Yes, she's killed people in the past, but it was always for a very specific reason. She never just went around killing people randomly. I can believe Daenerys becoming more ruthless, but I can't believe her becoming the Joker. Your man, your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Oh wait, no. She also cares now that people don't love her enough. In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! All shall love me and despair! Okay. A character trait that's never been established for Daenerys before this moment. Sorry, D&D. I want a refund. Cause I'm not buying it! And it's not even like killing the people was revenge against Cersei. Cersei doesn't care about the people. She hates them. Remember the whole walk of shame experience? And Danny knows Cersei doesn't care about the people. Tyrion straight up tells Danny several times that Cersei is using the people as meat shields. All that's left is just the Mad King nonsense. Great. We've thrown magical prophecy out the window and replaced it with biological determinism. Fantastic. Now we can still have Danny go too far and end up in a morally bad area without requiring her to systematically destroy the whole city. Again, this feels like the Star Wars prequels where the second Anakin gets tricked into being evil, he immediately goes and murders a bunch of younglings. On the horrible massacre scale, Danny went from a two to a Hitler. Let's turn that dial down to like 
Caesar killing some Germanic tribes. Have Danny be blinded by a bloodlust to kill Cersei. You could have the bells ring, they surrender, and then Danny flies straight to the Red Keep. She demands Cersei comes out and faces justice. Cersei doesn't go out because either she's a coward or maybe she's too busy trying not to get killed by Arya. So Danny starts burning the Red Keep down. All the common people below are screaming. Maybe a few get hit with collateral damage and all the people in the castle are dying. You can even have a nice little symbolic scene where Arya is just about to kill Cersei, but Danny's dragon melting the castle accidentally stops Arya and allows Cersei to escape. Cersei runs out, trying to hide in the crowds of people as cover, but Danny sees her, and Cersei panics and runs. Danny, with no regard for anyone else, just starts blasting through everyone to get to Cersei. This way, you could still have Daenerys killing lots of innocent people, have Jon and Tyrion look on in horror and regret. It makes so much more sense for Danny's character rather than destroying the entire city. Daenerys' problem is with Cersei not King's Landing. They never established the city itself having some greater symbolic representation to Danny. It's not like she grew up poor and abused there and just wants to see it burn. Danny has no strong negative feelings towards the city. Her anger is directed only at Cersei. And we've never seen Danny as the one to just lash out blindly against the world when she's angry. The whole burn it all down mentality is for people who've lost all hope and hate the world. Daenerys is still a queen with an army that literally worships her. Even the Mad King didn't try to blow up the city until he knew he had already lost, that he and his children would all die. Anyways, then the sequence could end when Daenerys accidentally kills some of her own people. Maybe she kills her Indra's Grey Worm, her most loyal of soldiers. Yeah, we've seen stuff like that before, but I'm trying to work with the variables D&D gave us. Which leads us to... Number 6, Cersei. Cersei's death was horribly unsatisfying. Kill him! Though I guess we should have expected that considering how the Night King went out, Cersei's a crazy evil person. If she had a dragon, you'd actually expect her to burn a whole city down without a care. Remember when Cersei had an undead zombie do things to a nun? Remember when Cersei chained a mother and daughter up so that they could watch each other die slowly? Remember when Cersei blew up the equivalent of the Vatican while sipping wine and twirling her mustache evilly? Yeah, I don't understand why D&D are trying to make her sympathetic. It's completely ridiculous. They deserve to die and I hope they burn in hell! So here's what you do. After Daenerys accidentally kills or wounds Grey Worm, she has her little shock wake-up moment, which allows Cersei to escape. Seeing that she's unable to leave the city by land, Cersei goes back through one of the secret passages that leads under the castle, trying to get to where the remnants of the Iron Fleet is to possibly escape. She's tired, bleeding, stumbling, at the point of exhaustion as her castle is falling down around her. You could have some nice symbolism as a frightened Cersei stumbles through the empty halls of a crumbling castle. Cersei has alienated and killed everyone around her just for these stone walls. And yet, when she's at her lowest point, these stone walls won't help her. The castle, much like herself, is all alone, damaged and empty inside. Then we can have Cersei limp her way to the basement, and there, on the brink of exhaustion and despair, she sees a figure in the distance and is suddenly filled with hope. He came back for me, she thinks. Jamie, my love, my golden knight came back to save me. But then, the momentary fantasy fades away, and we see it's not Jamie, it's Euron. Euron tells her that the city is lost, that she lost. Cersei grabs him, cries for help, but he pushes her away. He says something like, he wanted a queen, not a dead woman. Cersei falls to the dust and dirt as her castle crumbles around her, watching Euron walk away. It's then that she realizes, in her thirst for power, she gave up the one thing that mattered, her children, Jaime. These people brought her the only joy she ever experienced while the Game of Thrones brought her only misery. And now, she would die helpless and alone. And as this horrible realization of her entire life being a mistake crashes down upon her, so too does the castle itself. 
Now all this isn't perfect, but at least it's more coherent than what we got. If the writers wanted to have Danny go full genocide, it would take a lot more than a single episode. It would take a lot more than a single season. If this is where they wanted to end up, they should have been building to this from the beginning. And they had the perfect opportunity to. Once Daenerys rules the city of Marine, conflict emerges between the populace, the former slaves, and the former masters. The freed slaves want all the previous masters killed, and their wealth redistributed. Now, Danny's seen that very plan in action. I don't remember if they talk about it in the show, but in the book, after Danny gets the Unsullied from Astapor, frees all the slaves, and kills all the masters, the city falls into chaos and ruin. So she knows that plan doesn't work and instead wants the two sides to put their past behind them and work towards a better future. And of course, we know that's not gonna happen. Violence, riots, civil war spreads throughout the city. A mass group of rebels calling themselves the Sons of the Harpy appear and start killing off the Unsullied using guerrilla tactics. Then even the freed slaves turn on Daenerys for not simply murdering the former masters. Daenerys is shocked and betrayed. Every time she tries to make things better, with peace and harmony, everything only gets worse. Now maybe you're thinking, huh, that all sounds familiar. Well, it should, because what I just described is basically what happens in season five. That's why I said the setup is all there. The problem is in the conclusion. If D&D wanted Daenerys to get to the city-destroying point, Marine should have ended completely different. It should have ended in utter failure. Either the city tears itself apart until there's nothing left, or Daenerys gives up trying to fix it and leaves in disgust. This would leave Daenerys changed, her entire worldview shattered. No longer does she have the blind faith she once had in the common people. Now she begins to see the merits of stronger, stricter leadership. She comes to Westeros as already a somewhat broken and lost person. There she starts taking over the place, does some questionable things, starts falling down a darker path. However, when she falls in love with Jon, his love rekindles part of her we thought was lost. Then in the last season, have it be betrayal that causes her dragon and Missandei to die, not incompetence. While well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. Oh my dude, you just got pranked! Bet you didn't see that one coming, huh? Then when Jon threatens to leave her, it would make sense for Daenerys to fall back once more into darkness. She would see Jon's threat to leave her as the final betrayal, as the proof that no one can be trusted. She would then choose to rule by fear. But of course, we didn't get any of that. Daenerys is able to successfully bring a happy ending to Marine just by killing all the bad guys. This perfectly mirrors Cersei's situation in King's Landing. At the same time, she has her own people's uprising, the Sparrows. And how does she deal with it? Just kill everyone! Both Daenerys and Cersei solve their problems easily and simply by murder. All complexity is thrown out the window. There's no negative repercussions for any of this. That's why I call D&D's war is bad message complete BS. When it's convenient for D&D, the characters just kill all their enemies. Murder and war became an easy tool just to move the plot along. But now, suddenly, oh no guys, war is bad. No. Screw you. Your attempt at moralizing this late in the game is cheap and hollow, when the message until now has been the exact opposite. If you think D&D planned any of this out, you're sorely mistaken. They're flying by the seat of their pants here. People have been watching this show for years, invested in the characters, and for many, it was all for nothing. But it wasn't the fans who were betrayed the most. It wasn't George R.R. R. Martin. It was the cast and the crew. Watching the behind the scenes for this episode is awe-inspiring. The amount of work they put into this episode was crazy. How many hours did it take for people to build all these houses, craft all these details, do all the special effects? It wasn't just CG. They had guys being set on fire and jumping off rooftops working so hard on making this amazing spectacle, thinking that they'd proudly be able to tell their friends and family, I was a part of this. I helped build this. But now, no one cares. Or worse, they hate it. All this amazing work was to create something everyone will hate. All because D&D couldn't be bothered to figure out how to make it work.
I didn't expect to make another Game of Thrones video on a specific episode, but here we are. I plan on doing at least one more on the decline of the show overall, possibly tracing the characters' arcs from the beginning. So make sure to subscribe if you like this video or the last one. After that, I plan on finishing what I was working on before all the Game of Thrones stuff, an unbiased, yet funny and easy to understand explanation of the Mueller report, something which will loom over us all throughout the coming election and possibly even beyond. For the future of my channel, I plan to bounce back and forth between videos about movies, shows, and games, and videos explaining complicated political or social things in entertaining ways, like my Israel video or my Boy Scout video. Anyways, I just want to thank everyone who watched, liked, and shared my last video and helped it explode in popularity. All my subscribers who have stuck with me for so long. And of course, an extra big thanks to my patrons who helped me keep making these. Until the next one, friends.